There are times when the practice seems daunting, a lot of things to remember, a lot of things to do. Especially when you look at your own mind and it seems to be full of all kinds of turmoil. You can read about them, the minds of the arahants. Their task done, no passion, no aversion, no delusion, no suffering, no limitations. And that seems very far from the mind you're experiencing right now. This is called renunciate grief. The grief you feel when you realize that there's a lot to be done and you haven't done it yet. But the Buddha doesn't advise you to give up or not have any goals or say, well, I don't want to do this, because that's even more hopeless, because that gets you back into householder grief, which has no end at all. So it's useful to think about the path in at least two different ways. One is comparing it with the suffering you your experience if you weren't on the path. There's an image in the Inferno where Dante is going through hell, and there's one level of hell where everybody's in a whirlwind. People are spinning around, spinning around in the wind, and every now and then a face appears out of the wind. You have a brief snatch of a conversation, and then it goes. Then it may come back for another snatch, and then it's gone again, and then it's gone for good. That's a lot of what life, human life is like. We meet one another for a brief instant, and then it's gone. We may meet one another again, but then we're gone again. You see the light a little bit in your life, and then it gets obscured, and it doesn't end. At least if you don't decide that you want to get out. So when you think about the suffering and the hardships of the path, Realize that the sufferings and hardships of life are a great deal more. And when you think about the duties of the path, well, think about the duties of the world, the things you have to do in order to please other people, in order to keep your job, in order to deal with your family, deal with your friends, deal with your boss, deal with all the other things that go on in life. You realize there's no security in it at all. In it all. You think you've got a job with a big corporation and you're going to be safe because the corporation is going to last for a long time, it's too big to fail. Well, they decide that in order to not fail, they have to cut off their work staff and they come up with all kinds of fabrications so they don't have to be responsible. That's the way of the world. And many of the things you have to do are demeaning. Things you'd rather not do, but either hunger or poverty or fear of loss of your job, loss of status, forces you to do them. So think about that when the tasks of the path seem onerous. Then turn around and look at those tasks. There may seem to be a lot of them. All those foundations of mindfulness and all those noble truths and all those wings to awakening, all those recollections. It's too much to do at any one time, but the Buddha is not asking you to do them all at any one time. And he doesn't force you to do them. Remember, these are tasks that you take on because you see they're worthwhile. It's in that first line in the Karuna Metta Sutta, Karuna Yamata Gusalena. This is what should be done by those who aim at a state of peace. No one's forcing you to aim at a state of peace. The Buddha never set himself up as a god. But he says, if you look at the world the way it is, 
if you want to find peace, this is what you have to do. There are basically four tasks. Comprehending suffering or stress, abandoning its cause, developing the path to the cessation of stress, and then realizing the cessation. That's it, four duties. Now, the way you implement them may require other tools, but think of it j just as that. This is the over overarching framework you want to keep in mind at all times. This is what the Buddha called appropriate attention. The questions he asked, the teachings he gave, the ones that fit into this frame. Anything that didn't fit into this frame, he just put aside. And the truths are not just lists to read about and think about. They're categories for looking at your life. So at any one moment you can see what you've got to do. You run into some stress and you ask yourself, well, where is this? What is this? Try to start taking it apart. When the Buddha taught the five aggregates, this is why he taught the five aggregates, to help you take your suffering and stress apart, to understand what it's made of. Exactly what are you clinging to right now? So that you feel that stress, you feel that burden on the mind. It might be form or feeling or perception, i.e. the labels you put on things, the thoughts you fabricate about things, or simply holding on to consciousness, your awareness of the six senses. There's a clinging to some of these things or one of these things at any one time when there's stress. And you can cling in different ways. You can cling simply because you want some sensual pleasure out of these things, so you're clinging to your thoughts about those pleasures, planning, fantasizing. And either having your plants realized, and then, of course, the things are going to change, so they're realized only for a little bit, and then they're gone. Or your plans are frustrated, and there's views. Things have to be a certain way, and of course they're not going to be that way all the time. Practices and habits that you're stuck on. This has to be done that way, that has to be done this way. Placing a lot of obligations on yourself that are really not necessary at all. Forcing yourself to do things because you say, well, I've got to do it this way, but then suffering because of that. And then there's all those ideas of yourself. Who's going to gain the pleasure? Or who's the person holding on to these views? And what the views tell you about that person? So these are the different ways of clinging. So the Buddha offers you these to you as tools for analyzing what's going on when you're suffering. Learning how to look at your suffering in these ways helps, helps you to step back, and it depersonalizes it, de-romanticizes it. gives your handle for understanding these things. So it's a good task, trying to comprehend your suffering in these terms, because it helps to lighten the burden. And when you see that these things are stress, then you look for the cause. Why do you cling to these things in these ways? What's the craving? What underlies the craving? Right? have to trace it back through the different factors of dependent core rising, but it's essentially craving and ignorance. Compounded by the different intentions you have and the different ways you have of paying attention, the different perceptions you apply to things. All of these things come into play. So again, the teachings are there to show you that you have a variety of tools, a variety of ways of understanding what's going on. It's not that you have to hold all the tools in your hand 
all at the same time. That would be like building a house and holding the hammer and the saw and the wrench and the chisel and the planer and all these other tools in your hand all at once. Of course, you'd never get anything done. Unfortunately, these tools that the Buddha gives you are not tools that you have to carry around in your pocket or sling over your shoulder. They just kind of float around. And once you develop them, they're there. It's like they're floating in the air around you. Just pick them out of the air, use it, and then put it back where it was in the air. And you find that doing these tasks is not an onerous thing at all. Even though you may not get to the end of suffering right now, at least you lighten your burden. The same holds true with developing the path. Factors of the path are all good things to do. Having right view, right resolve, where you have no ill will for anyone, or you're not tied down to your sensual desires, you don't want to harm anyone, you engage in right speech, right action, right livelihood. You develop the desire to abandon unskillful mental qualities and to develop skillful ones in their place. The mind gets established in mindfulness, alertness. Concentration grows with a sense of rapture and ease. These are all good things to develop. They may not be easy, but they're good. And they're certainly a lot easier than the sufferings we go through if we don't develop these qualities. And when these qualities are developed, they allow us to let go of our passion for our craving. All the metal worlds that we create around things, when we lose our passion for them, they, they just stop. And that will allow us to realize the end of suffering. Which is the most amazing task of all. So these are tasks that you can apply right now and see results to some extent, at least right now. And as they become skills, you find that they do a better and better job of uprooting whatever suffering you've been experiencing, or at least uprooting the cause, getting, getting you past the suffering. So they're good tasks to develop, good skills to develop. No one's forcing you, aside from the fact that they're suffering breathing down your neck all the time if you don't. But the Buddha didn't sick the suffering on you. It's already there. You're already creating it. When you see that you've created enough, it's time to check out these tools, develop them as skills. And so even though the path may be long, I mean, it is a gradual path. But it does have its rewards all along the way. So take heart in that. And remember, it's one of the few things in the world that does come to closure. The affairs of the world never end. They just keep spinning around like that whirlwind. Well, the path does come to an end. So that right there is reason to take heart.